Well, we're going to take a break out of James uh, this morning, and, and I'd like to look at Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 24 and 25. And really, you know, looking at this question of, you know, how do we understand the church as, you know, are we an essential ministry? And, and, uh, and, and we're going to look at really just these couple verses. Let me start by reading the verses we're going to be diving into primarily today. And let us consider how to stir, one up, uh, stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is a habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. May God bless the reading of his word. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much again for the opportunity we have to come to worship you today. Father, to enjoy this time together. Father, I thank you for church and for just the value that there is of gathering together in a community, of, of encouraging each other, of supporting each other. Father, I thank you. And I pray now your blessing on our time. Thank you for the things that you're teaching me, the way that you're challenging me. And Father, I pray now that your spirit would speak through me and in spite of me. Father, help us to hear what each of us, each one of us, to hear what you have for us this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And over the past six months, we've, we've learned some new vocabulary in different areas of life. Uh, we've, one of the things is, through the risk of the spread of COVID-19, our state, along with many other places in the nation, had stay-at-home orders, which we had not had that before. And, and in these orders, what we found is that many of the business and activities in our community were closed, uh, unless you were deemed an essential business. And so there was a division between what was deemed as an essential business and what was deemed as unessential or non-essential. And so you had all these essential businesses were kept open and, and, then, and then most were closed, including churches. And, and it's interesting that over time, as some states have opened up, you know, that, that some have, have opened and moved churches you know, to the open section, essential sooner, others have kept them in the non-essential as they've opened other things. And, uh, and the question that really raises, that we have to ask is, is the church essential? Is the church as an institution something we should see as essential? Is the ministry of the church essential to our culture? Are the weekly meetings of the church essential? Essential for us in our own growth? Should we see them as essential? And let me even turn that around. It is, is it essential to be involved in a worship service in a church for us to grow spiritually. I tell you, over the past few months, there have been politicians who have made some very loud statements about this issue in the negative. The, their view that the church is not something that they see as essential. And let's take, for example, in California. In California, churches aren't allowed to open until they get to, to phase three of their uh, reopening plan. And that's after many other businesses, many other events that include large gathering of people, they're opening, but not the church. You see, in the church, they're the same category as, or in California, the church is the same category as nail salons and gyms and movie theaters. You know, they're nice to have luxuries, but they're not essential. They're seen as kind of similar to entertainment venues. And again, nice if you want to be involved with it, but not really something that's needed. What are some of the essentials in California? Well, liquor stores, marijuana dispensaries, uh, you know, uh, golf, you know golf, golf courses. Well, those are essential. You can't live without those, but we can live out without the church, according to those politicians. Or Nevada, likewise. There was a court case not long ago because there, there was a, a challenge on this ruling in Nevada that Nevada casinos are essential. And so casinos are allowed to open with 50% capacity but churches, regardless of the size of your building, you can't have more than 50 people inside at once and because they're not essential. Now, I want to tell you, fortunately, Ohio, we've not faced that kind of political oppression, and, uh, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful for Governor DeWine. I'm thankful for, through this all that he has really provided support for the churches. He's, he's allowed freedom and ministry within churches, and I'm very thankful for that. So at least for us, as we ask this question being a church here in Ohio, it's really not a political question, but it's more of a personal question. Is the church something that's essential to your life? Is gathering as part of the church something that is essential to you? Is it something that should be essential? And even as we ask this question, I want to point out that the real issue isn't what I think or what you think or what some politician thinks or what some media pundit thinks about the issue. The real question really should be, what does God think? And even there, it's not 
a question of what my opinion is, what God thinks versus your opinion, what we really need to do is we've got to say, has God said something clearly? Let's go to his word. Has he communicated something about the nature of the church that helps us to understand how to answer this question in this time? Well, as we dive into God's word, I think what we're going to find is that the Bible teaches that the ministry of the church is essential. It is essential for our culture. In Acts chapter 1, right before the, uh, you know, Jesus ascended into heaven, we're told that the disciples came to Jesus and asked him if this was the time that he was going to restore the kingdom of Israel. And basically, they were coming and they were saying, Jesus, you know, we think you're going to establish a political kingdom and it's going to be centered in Jerusalem and, and, and you're going to have you know, military might. And is that going to happen now? And, and Jesus basically looked at him and said, well, there's some things that are going to happen in it at times. And, and, and it's not for you to know all the end-time prophecy now, but let me tell you what I've come to do now. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And basically he's saying, yes, I have come to establish a kingdom, but it's not the kingdom that you expect. It's not a political kingdom. It's not a nation. You see, a political kingdom has power and they, they send out its people as warriors to establish that power. But no, my kingdom isn't political in nature, it's spiritual in nature, it's not a nation. I've come to establish the church. And the church is made of people, and my people will go out in my power, because I'm going to give you that power with the Holy Spirit, but you're going to not go as warriors, you're going to go as witnesses. And you're going to represent me in the culture through my message, through your word, through your lifestyle. But the church is essential. I've established the church in this culture to, to carry forth the message of the, my kingdom. Another passage in Matthew 16, 18. Jesus again taught that the church is the hope of our culture. He said this, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What he's saying is there's a battle for the culture. It's a spiritual battle. It's a battle where we're literally dealing against the powers of hell. And in this spiritual battle, I've now established my church in this culture, and it's the job of the church to now preach the truth, to literally you know, pre you know, go against the culture and battle against the powers of hell and prevail. And the gates of hell will not be able to withstand the advance of the church. The church is vital. Now, my friends, historically, this is something that was understood by most people in Western culture throughout much of history. And you can see this just simply, actually, by, by buildings. If you go to many cities in, in, uh, in, in Europe, especially older cities, what you're going to find is when you see the city, you see in the middle of the city, there right in the middle, there's often a church, a big church with a high steeple that is there for everyone to notice. Why? Because when those cities were built, they were built around the church. They were built around the cathedral. And the cathedral was built with the high steeple so that everyone would see that it was at the center. It is literally the center of the city because it was seen as so essential. Or think about even in American history. What you find in American history is that in many times, most times, as people would go and go west and they would start to establish a town, as they started to establish the town, one of the first buildings they built, always at the very center, was a church. Even in Ohio, you will go to many of these historic you know, or towns, and you'll go and you'll find a historic church, and you look at the date that that church was built, and it was within the first couple of years of that town being established. Why? Because the founders of that town said, out of everything we build, the most essential building is the church. That's the center. Because the church is essential, the most essential activity to everything that's going to happen in this town. My friends, so the Bible teaches that historically we've known that, and yet that principle is under attack. The church is essential to the culture, but it's not only essential to the culture, the meeting of the church is essential to us if we want to grow spiritually. And you see, according to the Bible, the church is not an optional organization. If we want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it's not something that we can choose to be involved in or not. No, it's seen as something that is essential. You know, people will say in our culture things, you know, I follow Jesus, but I don't, I don't really like the church. Or, you know, I follow Jesus, but I, you know, I, I, and I do my own church. Or I just watch on TV. Or, my, my friends, those are things that are reflections of the American culture. We, we live in this culture that's very ide or individualistic. You know, everything's personalized. 
but it's not really a statement that reflects the teaching of the Bible. No, the Bible is taught, and the church has believed since its foundation, that, that the church is always essential, not only for the culture, but for us spiritually. In fact, if you look throughout the New Testament, especially what you're going to find is that it consistently teaches that being involved in the church is essential to our spiritual growth. In fact, if you look at what the Bible says about how we grow spiritually, there's as much or more in the Bible that says how we grow spiritually as part of the church than there is about what it says about how we grow individually in our personal walk. Now, I don't say that in any way to downplay the importance of personal devotions and personal time with God. Those are very important. They are. They're essential. And you can't grow to spiritual maturity without those things. But what I want you to see is just as essential of those things are being connected to a church because you can't grow to spiritual maturity without being connected in the church. Now I could do a series of messages on, on this because it's so, you know, so prevalent throughout the New Testament. But let me just take one verse you know, that, that I, I think says this idea maybe a little differently. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Jesus said, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am amongst you. Now we know that the Bible teaches that if you're a follower of Christ, that the Holy Spirit is with you. You have the Holy Spirit with you at all times. Jesus promises in, in Hebrews 13, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's a wonderful truth. But I want you to see what he's saying here. This promise shows that there is a sense that God meets with us in a way that's distinct and unique when we gather together as a community that's different than what we could ever experience in that personal time. And the personal time's important, but we realize if all we have is that personal time, but we're not being part of this community where we're gathering with him with, him, with others, there's a sense that we're missing part of, of God's presence in our life. We're missing part of what's essential in spiritual growth. So the Bible teaches it's central, and that's the foundation between what we're looking at today in Hebrews 10. When he says, let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as some is the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now I want you to see that it's not only teaching that this is essential for us to do, but as you dig deeper into this, I want you to see that this passage actually is giving us a warning. It's warning us against Satan's strategy for disconnecting us from the community of the church. Again, look at verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together, as some in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, if you look at that, the actual command is pretty precise. The actual commands are not neglecting to meet together, but encouraging each other. All right? But then there's caveats that are, are put there in the middle of this. And, and let's look at what they are. First of all, he says, don't neglect to meet together. Not neglecting to meet, as some are in the habit of, as is the habit of some. And he's pointing out that even then, even at the very beginning of the church, there were some people that were saying, I can do this on my own. You know, I can, I, I can handle this. It's, it's not essential. And he's confronting that and saying, no, you don't neglect meeting together. You have to do that. And, and there's a warning that this is going to be a temptation. It's already happening. Don't give in to it. Then it challenges encouraging one another. And notice here, all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, why did God put this at the end? Why is it all the more important as we see the day drawing near? My friends, as I thought about this, and I prayed about it this past week, I really have increasingly grown to understand that I believe there's a prophetic element to what he's saying here. There's a prophetic element of this warning. See, God commands us to be committed to meeting together all the time. But he also says there's going to be times when things get worse. There's going to be times when opposition is greater. And in those times, part of Satan's strategy will be to try to disconnect believers from the church. God's giving us a warning that there's a specific attack, and, and we've got to be aware of it. When, things get, when, you know, when the culture gets more secular, when we get closer to the end of times, be aware this is the attack that's going to come. See it for what it is. Put up your defenses. Don't fall to it. You see, in the end time, Satan's going to try to discourage Christians and hinder the ministry of the church and by doing things that would keep believers from meeting together. God's warning us to watch out. 
and it may be things like the coronavirus and, and all that it had. It might be just busyness of work and boy, we're just too tired to get up and it could be all kinds of things if we just get out of the habit of doing that. But what Satan's going to do is he's going to try to distract us and he's going to give us the message, you know what, this, this meeting together, it's, it's non-essential. It's not essential for you to do. Oh, it's okay if you miss it. It's not a big deal. Well, you just, you know. My friends, there's a prophetic warning here. But there's not only a warning of what to watch out for, there's a challenge for us to remember what's true. That God's teaching us that, that regarding, uh, that the, God's teaching here about regarding our increased need for community when things get worse. He's saying that as we gather together at the church, it's important, but all the more as the end times draw near. You know, what, what is always important with our relationship with God, what's always important that we meet together, hey, when things get harder, it even becomes more essential. As the culture moves further and further away from God, it becomes more challenging to live out our faith, and we need each other more. We need to be together. We need perspective. We need to help people interact with us to, remember, to realize that we need a biblical perspective. You know, I think about how Paul in first, or 2 Timothy 3 he says, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. In the last days it will get worse. In the last days there will be stress and pressure and hardship and opposition. Those things will happen. It's not going to get easier for us as followers of Christ. It's going to get harder. And it gets harder. How are we going to stand? How do we stay consistent in our faith? How do we grow in the midst of an increasingly hostile uh, culture? Look what Hebrews is telling us. In that time, at least part of our plan has to be not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day drawing near. My friends, if we need each other when things are good, doesn't it make sense we need each other all the more when things are hard? Now, I know some might say, well, okay, well we're doing that. We're, you know, and some of you, I'm going to step on a few toes here, and I'll warn you in advance. You might be, well, we're staying at home, and we're watching, and... and uh, I, 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 I want to tell you, I've been praying about this for, for some months of, to say the right time, the right words, and the right way. I pray that God gives me the ability to speak truth and grace. Um, I know that there are some people that are at extreme high risk for complications with the coronavirus. And many people, for that reason, are self-quarantining, not only from church, but from a number of other things as well. And, and some of you even, you know, you might feel a little more comfortable coming to the outdoor service, and that's why we're trying to do those, to give you an opportunity to participate in community worship uh, when the weather's nicer. Yeah? And in, in December, we're probably not going to get away with that. But as long as the weather, we're going to try again. There are other people that, that have long-term medical concerns. There are people that haven't been able to come because of medical reasons before the coronavirus. And if you're in either of those groups, I want you to know that we are committed. In fact, this has probably made us more aware, and we are more committed to trying to minister to you uh, than we have ever been. And that's not only through this long-term commitment to online streaming, but we're, you know, we've set up rooms to be able to offer more midweek Sunday or classes so that we want you to participate in Bible studies and things midweek through online. We're, we're trying, we've got some creative ideas we're working on that we want to make this as available to as many people as possible. That's important to us. It's a long-term commitment. But I also realize that there are others who, um, who aren't necessarily at high risk, and, and you've gotten out of the habit of coming to church. And, and it's not primarily because of risk, but oftentimes, it, well, there might be a little concern, and, but it's also more convenient. Man, it's, you know, it's nice coming to church in slippers. It's nice being able to pause the pastor and, and go, you know, go get some, refill the coffee. It's, it's, you know, some of those things are nice. And, and I want to tell you lovingly, again, if that's you, then you're missing something essential. You know, I believe that the words of Hebrew, Hebrews 10 here, are God's word written directly to you. Let us not, or let's consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting, neglecting to meet together, as some have the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the right day drawing near. You see, and when it talks about this, I don't think it's just even talking about coming into a big group Sunday morning worship. I think it's even beyond that. I think it's the idea of community groups, of being involved in each other's lives in such a way that we're interacting, where we're encouraging each other, where we're, where we're able to be involved in spurring each other and on towards love and good deeds, where we have that level of interaction. 
See, but I want you to see that if this indeed has a prophetic element, if God was indeed writing this and saying, recognize that in the last days, as we get closer, the attack's going to come up and, and Satan's going to try to convince us that the church isn't essential, that we need to be committed to meeting all the more as the day draws near, I want you to see, my friends, that's God's giving a warning. It's a warning about this is Satan's strategy. And, and there are these things that are drawing you away, and I understand, I understand they draw you away, but I want to encourage you, that's Satan's strategy, drawing you away from something that God says is essential. He's warned you against this danger. Don't fall into the trap when you see that it's right here. Now, even in this, I want to tell you, I, you know, just prayed about how to say this right. Because there are, again, some that are extreme high risk, and, and it's maybe wisest for you to stay home. And even in that, you know, I said, I don't want to put guilt on people. I don't want, you know, I was thinking, does it make people miss it all the more and feel that they're terrible that they're not here? And, and then I realized, you know, if you're not here, if you can't be here, you know, it's not bad that you really miss it. It's not bad that you, that you, that you really miss something that you know should be normal. It's, you know, if you have a couple where one, you know, one, somebody is, is uh, um, you know, stationed, you know, overseas for a period of time, and it's not bad that you talk and you miss and you just, you long to be together and you're just re you just, you want to stay in love with each other because you know that's the way it should be so that when you get to be together, you can't wait to come back. And for some that can't be here, I, I hope that that's the case. Now, there might be some too that would say, yeah, but there's some risk and I'm not high risk and there's some risk and... Again, let me just try to say this compassionately, lovingly. Throughout the history of the church, the church has faced a lot of persecution. Throughout the history of the church, there have been believers who have gone to church knowing that going to church could be at the risk of being arrested or being even killed for their faith. And even today, there are, there are believers in places like China or in the Middle East that are going to church and knowing that just the act of going to church could be something that could be fatal. These are people that have consistently taken risks because they understood that church is essential. Literally, it's worth risking their life. Now, friends, if nothing else, I want to say this. If that time ever comes where we're faced with that kind of opposition, where there is a risk in going to church, I hope and pray that we understand that church is essential and that like the early believers, we will have a commitment to that which is essential even if it's at the risk of being arrested, of losing our job, of losing our lives. I hope and pray that I have the kind of faith of those early followers of Christ. And that faith will be demonstrated then as well as now. Now just real briefly, let me just wrap up and just say it's not only that we're supposed to meet, but, but this passage also tells us about something of the nature of our meeting. About what it looks like when we are together. Again, look at verse 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as some the habit, or as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's calling us to be involved in, where we not only come as a group and walk out, but that we actually get to know each other. We spend time together. We build relationships where there's a level of intimacy. There's a call to intentionality in these relationships. Look what it says again in verse 24. It doesn't say spur one another on towards love and good deeds. It says let us consider how to. It means we've got to think about it. We've got to stop and think. It means that when we come to church, we should take some time and say, how can I encourage somebody today? When we get here, we should look around and say, who is it that I can encourage? Who's somebody that I don't know that I can greet and get to know them? They might be a visitor that might need to be welcomed. I need to spend time and think about how do, not just what do I receive? How do I be that? Some people say, well, I came to church and nobody greeted me. It's not a very friendly place. And Well, you start being a friendly one. Go talk to three people today. It will become a really friendly place really quickly. We need to think about that. Intentionality. Not only intentionality, but in, in relationships where we, where we lovingly speak truth to each other in each other's lives. What does it say in verse 24? Consider how to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. When you think of a spur, you think of what, like it's on a horse. And it literally has this idea of irritating. And some people are thinking, man, that's it. I've got a spiritual gift, spiritual gift of irritation. I'm really good at that. You know, it's, no, that's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about here is it's saying that we should be involved in relationships where we can speak truth to each other, even if it's something that we may not always want to hear. 
even if it's, you know, be willing to step on each other's, that's, step on each other's toes. That's what I'm, I know I'm doing. God called me to do some of that today, and I know I'd be maybe stepping on toes. But it's because I have a relationship where I care about you enough where I want to do what God has called. Now, I want you to realize that for most of us, it, it isn't necessarily saying that we should be going out and, and saying things to each other. You need to hear this. The emphasis isn't on what we say. It's on the, on the question, do we have the relationships where we give other people the right to do that? Do I have people that are close enough that I give them the right to say things to me? Do I have those kind of friendships here? Because that should be the norm. That's what should define the church community. God wants us to go there with each other. And not only that, but he says that let us um, uh, encourage each other all the more as you see the day approaching. God calls us to graciously, and great, graciously encourage each other. And this is the idea of you know, coming alongside of, walking alongside of, it's, it's, it's connecting to the other person with sympathy and empathy and, 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 and just offering words of encouragement, offering words of hope. Hey, anybody discouraged this week? Anybody go through stuff? It's like you just get worn down. We all do. And you know what? This should be the place where, where it's not talking about what's the latest politics or the latest riots or the latest that. It's, it's, hey, let's encourage each other. You know, hey, how's things going? Can I speak a positive word? Can I say something that's building each other up? What would happen if, if just even in church, we just said, okay, let me think about this. And, and every time we came to church, we said, okay, before I leave, I want to find three people. I want to say something positive to them. I want to encourage them. I want to, I want to thank them in some way. I want to encourage them. I want to compliment them. Man, if each one of us said, before we leave, we're going to say that to at least three people, yeah, a lot of really neat community is going to start happening in this church. It's going to start happening in this community. We're going to not only meet together, but we're going to meet together with the purpose of spurring each other on towards love and good deeds, encouraging each other, and being more and more intentional, all the more as we see the day approaching. But friends, if, if you're not here today, and, and, and again, some, you, you, know, you need to stay home at high risk. If there's some that you're not here, I'm going to challenge you. We want to see you here. And I say that for your benefit. I say that not as my opinion, but hopefully from God's word. And I encourage you to come out, to, to make that a priority. If God says that church is essential, then it should be essential in the way that we live our lives. And for us, that when we come, I'm, if you're here today, the bad news, I'm going to give you homework. I'm going to pray in a moment, and we're going to dismiss. And your homework is, okay, well, let's go do this. And that means consider how to spur each other on towards love and good deeds, encouraging each other. And that means I'm going to challenge you before you leave, go talk to three people. Look for three people you could just say something positive to, to encourage, to say thank you to. Don't leave before you do. Let, let a little community happen. Let's try to be intentional of, of not only meeting together, but doing it the way that God has called us. Because you know what? It sure seems like the end's drawing near. It, it sure seems like things are getting worse and things are getting harder. And if God's word is true here, we've got to recognize that in this time, we need each other to be the church to each other more than ever. So let's make that commitment to be that to each other, even today. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of this time. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to come. And Father, to be able to dive into your word, thank you for the challenge that's here. Thank you, Father, that your word is so practical and true that even when we look at all that is happening now, with the coronavirus and church shutdowns and essential and non-essential, and we look at a passage like this, and Father, you're telling us even here, no, this is all, I knew it coming beforehand. I'm giving you a warning. Father, help us to see this as a strategy of the evil one. Father, help us to not, to not be taken captive. Father, help us to be the church. Father, help us to take what you call essential and to make it essential in, in our own practice. And Father, help us even now before we leave to not only be content that we came, but Father, to take that intentional effort to say, well, let me go encourage, let me go, let me go spur somebody on to our love and good deeds. Father, help us to be the church, to be encouraged even as we walk out because we were the church to each other here this morning. Father, thank you. We pray this all in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Lord's Day. Remember to do your homework.